Hey, San, welcome to the Z Learning Podcast. Thank you so much for stopping by today. Absolutely. I look forward to uh, to talking with you and your uh, your listeners and your viewers today. Awesome. So, hey, San, before we get into all the things that you're doing with leadership and learning from the great books and your awesome podcast, love to hear a little bit about you, your background. How did you get into this subject? Tell us a little bit about you know what you've done in the corporate world and entrepreneurship, et cetera. Absolutely. So uh, uh, once again, thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, love to run down my resume for folks. So if you don't know who I am, um, as Zev has said, my name is Hassan Sorrells. I am the host of the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, uh, where we read a great book of, um, of literature that you may have fallen to sleep to in high school. And we pull out elements from that book and uh, we apply them to your real lived leadership life. Now, how did I get involved in all of that? Well, um, I spent a number of years in higher education and working with teams and leaders um, to try to make uh, things work better in higher ed and to make people work better in higher ed. I have a background in conflict management and negotiation uh, with my master's degree um, in those areas it's from Abilene Christian University in Abilene, Texas. Um, I also uh, spent a number of years um, writing and teaching, um, and so I was an adjunct instructor at a number of different um, a number of different um, universities and colleges all across the um, all across the East Coast um, and uh, and even in the Midwest. And so that all of those experiences kind of came together for me um, in about 2013 when I looked around at all of my experiences and I looked around at everything that I had done, and I said, you know, there are people on this planet in this country who don't know what I know about the basics of conflict management. Uh, they don't know what I know about the basics of interpersonal communication. They haven't studied the things that I've studied. And so I literally took, and this is just how simple it is, folks. I took my curriculum that I had learned at ACU and, and the things that I had put together for other people. And I looked at that paperwork and I said, what are the places, what are the skills in here that people need to know? And then I took those skills and I said, where is the one place where they need to know them the most? And if I can't get into, get, at, get at them in families and I don't quite have enough um, knowledge of theology to get at them in churches or in religious organizations, I'm going to have to go to the place where people spend 90% of their lives now. And that is at work. And here's how work can be defined. Work is a place in general where you work with people or where you're, you're, you're cobbled together with people that you would not have naturally picked. You would not have naturally chosen these people. And you're, you're being tasked with accomplishing a goal that you may not necessarily personally care about all the time. And that creates friction, uh, that creates conflict, but it also creates opportunities for learning and for leadership. And so that's a very, very brief rundown, sort of in about three minutes um, of how I got to, to where it is I am today. And then we can sort of spiral off and go in different places from all of that. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's really instructive and helpful how you explain how you adapt leadership uh, to the corporate entity, you know, because I think a lot of people, uh, their gut reaction might be like, you know, there's a lot of books about leadership and business. Um, I know when we've discussed in the past, so sometimes you read a few business books, you've read them all. Um, mm -hmm. And you just, I think it, when they hear your podcast, somebody might think at first like, oh, okay, you know, it's taking leadership to the business world because, you know, that's where the money's at. But you listen to this podcast and you're like, this is really, really deep. And this is substantive, you know, unlike the 90, maybe 99% of, of, of the business content that you hear these days like this is actually it, it's it seems clear your mission is truly to to impart these lessons um and like you said we spend for better or worse the majority of our lives working it's probably the best place um to get people you know knowing about these really important ideas that are important not only in business but in life well and you know look a couple of different ideas pop out at me from what you've said, and it, and it relates to kind of what we're talking about, well, not relates, but it is part of what we're talking about here. Look, most people who started businesses in the past, and I'm talking about pre-industrial revolution, pre-1880s, right? Because it isn't as if we somehow discovered business 
when Great Britain went into industrialization in the late 19th century. Mm-hmm. Businesses have always been around. Give me a break. Let's be real here. But how did people learn to sell bushels of extra corn to their neighbor? Or how did they learn to um, scale up wine presses or scale up olive presses in order to press olive oil for all of their neighbors? How did they learn to do that in the ancient world and then in the pre-modern world and then in the world of, of the monarchs and the kings of Europe and not just in Europe, but also in Africa, um, on the Asian continent, and of course in North America? How did people learn this if there were no you know, Harvard MBA programs for corn farmers? <laughs> How the hell did they learn sales and marketing and management? How did they learn how to lead people? Well, here's imagine how they, they did learned. that without an MBA. That's crazy. I, I, I know it's shocking. They <laughs> didn't have to spend one hundred and twenty thousand dollars on an education that they could have gotten for a buck twenty in late fees at the public library or from listening to my podcast for free. Mm-hmm. Anyway, no. Here is how they got this information. Here's how they got it. They read books, which was a collection of wisdom when books started being published, and even before that, scrolls, manuscripts, uh, the wise leaders of the community, they went around and they got the wisdom of the ages from those people, and then they applied it. That's it. It wasn't wasn't hard. We've made it infinitely more complicated than it has to be. And look, don't get me wrong. Psychology and management at a certain point in a book hit a ceiling for what they can provide for you as insights at a practical level. You have to go out and you have to figure out how to take all of that technical nuts and bolts stuff and turn it into emotional things that you could feel something about. And there's no better way to understand, and I I often say this to folks, there's no better way to understand emotional intelligence than by reading Daniel Goleman and also reading Jane Austen. You Mm -hmm. have to read them both at the same time. If you want to find out about strategy, there's no better teacher than Shakespeare. Read King Lear and read Julius Caesar. You know, uh, both of those will teach you more about strategy and tactics than all the Jim Collins good to great books that you could possibly read. And it's not to say that Jim Collins is bad. I've read good to great. It's not to say that Daniel Goleman is bad. I have emotional intelligence on my bookshelf. I've read that book several times. It's dog-eared. But the practical application to real human beings living their real lives and collecting that from the wisdom of the ages can only be found through the great books of literature. That well said. So let's dive deeper into that a little bit. You know, a lot of people who want to learn how to be, uh, you know, develop their leadership skills or personal development, either in business or, you know, in the nonprofit world. I, you know, what do you what do you say to people like that who might be thinking, well, OK, I want to develop my business, uh, my my leadership skills, my persuasive speaking ability, whatever it might be. Um and they say, well, I, I'll, I've read Del Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People, you know, Sean Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, um, maybe Simon Sinek, you know, um, Leaders Eat Last. Um, and I, you know, I don't know all of your influences. Uh, and they'll say, I, I hear th- I hear that those books, you know, maybe they, they talk about leadership in a direct way. Um, how do you how can you explain how they can learn? lessons in leadership from say Jane Austen was the example you gave before, or I don't know, Shakespeare or, or, um, you know, uh, any of the other books we read in school, F. Scott Fitzgerald, how do, how do people sure. yeah. like, what's your case for them? Why they should go beyond the also very important um, kind of standard leadership business management uh, books. Because there's two sides to your brain. There's the left side and the right side. And there's been a ton of research that you can go look at on on this this great sampling tool we have called the internet. (laughs) And you can access this great sampling tool from this great search tool we have called Google or, or whatever other search tool it is you may like to pick. And you can go and look at, again, the wisdom of the ages. But the thing is, if the wisdom that you are seeking is all left brain wisdom, you're not actually activating on the right creative brain side of your of your experience you're you're abandoning part of that experience now let me be very clear many people don't think they're creative they don't look at, at leadership as a creative act they don't look at leadership as a act of co-creation with someone else they don't look at leadership they don't 
view management in its rudest form as being an artistic act. They look at it as being a practical one because in the West, what we've done over the course of the last hundred years, due to the industrialization efforts of fine folks like Henry Ford and John Dewey, <laughs> we have allowed ourselves to be removed from the emotional right brain pieces of all of this. But the reality is we have yet to excise our right brains and all the things that our right side of our brain does from our experience. And so here's where it's practical. And here's what I would say to your listeners who are having that objection. When you're dealing with a difficult person, the first thing you're going to think of is not how Simon Sinek taught you how to deal with difficult people. You're just not. That tip is not going to float to the top of your brain. What is going to float to the top of your brain, however, is going to be a combination of the last movie you watched and the emotions you felt about it, the last book you read and the emotions you felt about that, how those two things come together in the last interpersonal interaction you had and how well that worked, then the interpersonal interaction with that person, and then maybe all the way at the back end, you might remember that there was a guy named Cynic who mentioned something about this and might be very interesting. And by the way, that's all going to happen, to quote Malcolm Gladwell, in a blink, and you're going to open your mouth and start talking. And at that point, the right brain and the left brain merge, and now you're in a different spot. And don't get me wrong, look, our consultancy... Um, leadership toolbox, all of these tools, leading keys that we have, and we'll talk about those later, are designed to help with the practical skill sets. Because I do believe in the practical skill sets. I believe in weightlifting <laughs> on all of this. I believe in practically doing it. But I also understand that the most practical people who are pushing practical advice in the world, in this space of business and management and leadership, many of them have backgrounds in the humanities, like English and philosophy and the arts. That's not an accident. And that's it's hugely validating, honestly, to hear you say that, because um, you know, I, I didn't do I, I didn't I didn't go to business school. Um, I was a history major. Um, mm -hmm. so people used to joke, oh, that's the those are the kind of majors if you want to live in a cardboard box. Um, but you know. I, I disagree. Um, I think there's a lot you can learn from the lessons of history, from from leaders of the past, from strategy, from the mistakes that have been made uh, over the centuries. Um, and I remember hearing back in college, but I didn't really truly internalize it and see that it was true until I got older. Some of the, the greatest business minds uh, really, like you said, have a background in the humanities. Um, and I'm not putting down, there are so many things I wish I had learned earlier that I had to learn on my own later. Uh, that are important, um, hard and soft skills in, in business, and probably many of the things that you that you you know you help businesses with at Leadership Toolbox. Um, and I'm not. This is not a put down, but I will say for a lot of people, those are things you can. A lot of things you can learn, like you said, you don't need an MBA to to learn. You can you can learn on your own. There's so much on the internet now. There's your podcast. There are blogs. There uh, there's there's so many ways you can learn it there are masterminds um but the kind of things that teach you how to really think in a broad way and really work with different kinds of people uh it's true the great books or or like you said movies i mean there's so many things i i think i've learned from many series that i've watched you know sure they're entertaining but there's also at least the really well done ones like uh have a lot of substance and teach you about life so yeah, well, when I first great. watched Game of Thrones with my wife, I literally turned to her and looked at her and I said, this is everything that I do with organizational behavior, except the only difference is the average manager doesn't have an 800 ton fire breathing dragon. They would like to have one because it would make it would make. Um, the whip that they are using or desire to use on people in their hearts uh, a lot more effective. But what they don't understand is everybody in their organization wants to have an 800 ton dragon or thinks they're an 800 ton dragon. So after we take all that out, all the ego and the posturing and the nonsense, what are you left with? Well, you're left with Game of Thrones in some organizations. Some organizations are like The Sopranos. I watched that show too, right? Great show. Yep. Great show. Some organizations are like The Wire or Breaking Bad, right? Okay. 
there's a reason why these shows, there's a reason why Julius Caesar or King Lear or The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway or um, or uh, Roughing It by Mark Twain, right? Or, or even Huckleberry Finn, which is a more popular book or Jack Kerouac on the road, which we read on the podcast. There's a reason why these books, these films, these 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 cinematic experiences beyond just entertainment resonate with us and they resonate in our soul and the reason why is while they may be um caricatures of reality in some cases they are they also allow human beings to walk around ideas that might be actually not good but they might actually really work when in a low risk kind of way and so we have to be giving, we have to be providing people uh, um, an inexpensive, which is what the internet does, an inexpensive, low risk way of walking out these business ideas and walking out these business practices with other people so that we can get to genuine innovation. Because that's what innovation is. It's finding out which ideas work, finding out which ideas don't work, chucking the ones that don't work, and then executing ruthlessly on the ones that do. Yeah, for sure. And like some of the examples you said, and they're, I think sometimes from some of the like more fantasy or sci-fi literature it can make, it could inspire people in practical ways to make innovations in, in technology. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes just watching something even if it has nothing to do with business. It just stimulates that creative part of the brain that makes you see things in a totally different light and have a new idea. And you might not at the time even realize where you got that idea. Like it just... Mm -hmm. Uh, from from watching these kind of fantasy things and even some of the other examples, like I've watched these, uh, like you said, The Sopranos or Boardwalk Empire or uh, not about organized crime, but suits. And and some mm -hmm. of these things are unrealistic. Some of the things you would definitely not want to do in real life, but you can definitely learn like certain things about negotiating, certain things about um, who to who to trust or 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 what are the motivations behind other people. There's a lot of things about human nature that I think are integral. Bingo, the psychology of human nature. Um, and not psychology in a scientific, social science kind of way. Not psychology in I'm going to run an experiment on 500 people and get the data and come to a conclusion. That's interesting and we need that. But we also need a space for the creative interpretation, not of the data, but the creative interpretation of the experiment. And the reason why we actually need more of this, not less, and this segues us sort of into another topic area, is that with these large language models that we euphemistically call AI now, these large language algorithms are going to do the specializing work for us. I hate to tell you folks who are listening and watching, but the future is not a future of specialization. So for a long time in the West, not necessarily globally, but a long time in the West, and the West merely means Canada, the United States, um, you know, uh, Western Europe, um, Japan, South Korea. Uh, I, I would I would classify that as the classic definition of the West. And y'all can argue with me and send me send me don't send Zev emails. It's okay. Send me the emails. That's fine. <laughs> um, you could argue with me and tell me that I'm wrong. Well, I'm with fine. you. Japan definitely. Like, yeah, I know what you mean for sure. Absolutely. You know these 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 industrialized societies that have moved past. Um, industrialization and have moved on and have done that movement based on rule of law and certain um, socio freedoms, socio freedoms, socio economic freedoms that we value and we say are the best ones. Okay. And by the way, we can disagree if they are the best and the outcomes and all that. And we do a lot of back chatter about that. The internet's full of it. You can go find those folks anywhere. Now that we define the West. Well, in the West, what we have done economically and socially and culturally for the last at least 50 years, if not closer to 60 to 70, is we have tacitly said to people, going back to the MBA, that if you go into an MBA program or you go into a legal law program or you go become a consultant and an accountant, you have specialized. And because you have specialized, more rewards will go to you in terms of money, perks, societal status. And that if you went to school and just got a business administration degree, that was too general. You didn't specialize enough. You're not concentrating enough. And because you didn't concentrate enough, not as many rewards are going to accrue to you. As a matter of fact, fewer re rewards are going to accrue to you. And this has caused a split between people who are specialists and people who are generalists. But here's the thing with those algorithms, kids. 
the algorithms are more specialized than you could ever be. They're not more general. They're more specialized. We've seen this over the last 20 years of social media. We're going to see this even more in the large language models and the data collection that they are going to be doing. We're already seeing this with chat GPT-4. Um, we're already seeing this with BARD and whatever it is that Microsoft is, or, or not Microsoft, sorry, Google is pushing out there. That's going to be specialization at a, at a question level. So when I ask a question to the internet, it's going to specialize all the way down to what I specifically need to me. Sorry, kids, you can't beat that. So the future is actually a future for human beings of generalization. Now, if that seems scary to you because you just spent a ton of money going to school to get an accounting degree to be specialized somewhere at one of the big four agencies, the big four consulting agencies on the East Coast of the United States, I apologize that people lied to you, but you still have an opportunity to become more of a generalist and broaden the base of your knowledge, broaden the base of your understanding, broaden the base of your skills. And reading and understanding and executing on great books is the beginning stages of that expansion. Wow. So there's a there's a lot to unpack here. Um, so first of all, uh, one thing I, I love that from hearing you say is, you know, I have I have passions outside of marketing and business. I'm I also enjoy reading philosophy of different types. Um, I enjoy as a very layman learning a little what I can about quantum physics or things going on in, in, in science. And, you know, one thing I don't do enough, but I did a lot as a kid and I'd like to get back to it. Your podcast has helped inspire me to get back to reading some nonfiction. Uh, I'm sorry, fiction books, getting back to reading fiction uh, and literature and things like that. Um, and I think a lot of those things, they're not a side hobby or distraction. They also can really from what you're saying, uh, impact and strengthen you even in a business context. Uh, and I think that we have, I wouldn't say we've been lied to, obviously, it might have been right that econ economically it was it was advantageous maybe for a few decades, but um, being narrow, uh, narrow specialist, and now, like you said, it's getting more and it's gotten more and more narrow is not going to be advantageous going forward. Um, it sounds like you're saying the Renaissance man is going to make a comeback, which is awesome. Very, very, I think it's definitely good to be broad. Um, and it's a little counterintuitive only in the respect that, you know, um, somebody might think that today with technology and AI and, and how we've gotten increasingly more specialized and niche uh, over the last few decades, somebody will might think the humanities uh, literature, um, broad, you know, broad kind of uh, generalism, that's making a comeback. Like that's going to blow a lot of people's minds because it's so counterintuitive. I think it's you know. well, 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 never let it be said that I don't go against the grain. <laughs> You'll even find that in my podcast. So, uh, you know, look, um, Broad thinking used to be the provenance um, of, or used, yeah, the provenance of the elite, right? The elite used to be broad thinkers. And when you think about the elite, I don't want you to think about whoever you may have in your head as a listener or as a viewer of this podcast where you may assign a conspiracy to them about something going on in our socio cultural political landscape mm -hmm. currently. Don't think about elite in that kind of definition. Instead, I want you to think about elite in terms of Plato. Plato was elite in his time. Or um, Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was an elite in his time. I'm going to say another famous name. Um, uh, uh, Andrew Carnegie was, was considered to be a robber baron. Um, but he didn't think of himself as being elite, although he was elite in his time. And now we're going to bring this forward. I'm going to name another name. George Orwell was an elite in his time. He was an elite English writer. Okay. Now. Thomas Jefferson. You know. Thomas Jefferson, right? A man who a man who had more library books <laughs> and had a, a library that was so extensive, the man had to sell part of it to pay for his plantation. 
He went broke buying so many books. I learned recently. Went yeah. bro- right. Yep. Went broke buying books. Now we can knock Jefferson and knock down his statues and all that other kind of stuff. The man went broke buying books. What does this mean? What can we take from these data points? Well, here's what we could take from these data points. Increasingly, if we continue to go down the road of specialization, thinking that we are going to out-specialize the machine, which I think many folks believe they will be able to do that, and they may not necessarily be saying it, but their actions are proving it, their public actions and their private actions are proving it, what we will wind up in is a space where broad thinking that contextualizes action becomes merely the province of the elite. And that's insane to think about. Why would we cede all of that ground to people who may not necessarily be deserving of it, whatever that may mean, and may not necessarily have the wisdom or the capability to handle the outcomes and the insights that are going to come from that knowledge and from those decisions. So I assert that because we have more access to more information than any, literally any people ever in history, we have a responsibility to broaden our base of understanding in opposition to what we see happening here. Now, the other dynamic we're fighting against, Zev, and I, you haven't mentioned it yet, but you've kind of skirted around it, is the dynamic of utility. And we've kind of explored a little bit of this on the podcast um, already in a couple of different forms. And we have an upcoming episode where we talk about Orwell and a, a guy named Thomas De Quincey um and um and Northrop Fry and um from those three gentlemen from their three essays we were able to glean the idea we were able to pull from that the idea that we live in a time of utility where if something isn't immediately useful an insight a, a data point um a piece of knowledge uh we think that it's useless and so we dump it in the garbage can i think it's trivia we, right. It's something to win. It's something to win trivial pursuit on a Friday night from and, you know, have a third glass of Chardonnay and then forget by the time you get home. Right. <laughs> Here's a challenge question. It's counterintuitive for, for everybody listening today. What if utility wasn't actually the whole point of gaining knowledge? What if everything didn't have to be useful right now? What if our lives were actually long and we actually thought of our lives as long and we realized that this data point, while maybe not useful at this point, this construction of context, maybe not useful right now with this group of people I'm trying to lead right now, will potentially be useful in the future. I'm not the first person, by the way, to challenge this idea of utility. Um, The great um, investor Ray Dalio um, actually challenges this idea as does, interestingly enough, in his own unique and inimical way, Warren Buffett. Big fan of both. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't believe me, go read his, go read his um, investor letters, which are are literally art in and of themselves. And they are about rejecting utility in favor of, yes, doing things that work, but not subsuming everything to that and realizing that there's more than just one kind of, of usefulness or one kind of truth, such as it were, in the world. Yeah, and I think you know, uh, with with my upbringing and most people's upbringing, probably in the last few decades in the U.S., um, you know, many of us have been trained to think of knowledge just uh, as utility. And even to myself, I wrestle because I've I've always had like a knowledge for its own sake uh, as a value. I've always been interested in a lot of different things. Some might call trivia. But then I also have the the pragmatist side of me, and I think just, and I think a lot of people do. Um, I think generalized knowledge doesn't just make us less boring at cocktail parties or just um, more interesting. I think to appeal to the, to the pragmatists in the room, um, it also, like you were getting at, um, you don't know when that knowledge might be useful, and having a broad base to draw from. Uh, I think that's actually where creativity comes from. Creativity is usually taking one idea and another unrelated idea and finding a way how they connect. Um, James and, Al- James Altucher calls it idea sex. 
Oh, I listened to his podcast. Would love to have him on actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, e- exactly. And, and that's, and that will show up in so many different areas of your life where you can, uh, in relationships and business, um, in many different areas that are maybe not always useful, uh, clearly evident that they'll be useful now uh, in ways you can't even imagine. And I think that creativity and, and the broad thinking, which powers creativity, gets at the heart of, dare I say, what makes us human. Mm-hmm. And in this world of AI, where machines will do every specialized task for us, um, they have a lot of information. AI, you know, the internet, th- there's so much information, but knowing how to connect it um, and, you know, synthesize it um, and find the ways that you can th- think of new ideas, not just regurgitate old ideas, but come up with um, s- strategies or creative solutions um, to take all that, all those data points together and make something new. Not so good at, don't know if they'll get better, but what is your uh, what do you think, how do you think we should approach AI and how can we become, you know, more human, whether in business or or what's the place of humanity? Broader question, I guess. So the first part of that, how should we approach AI? Um, we should approach AI the same way that the first human being approached fire. With, with caution, um, with respect, with humility. Um, and of course, that first human being burnt half their cave out <laughs> because that's kind of what we do as human beings. We we hit upon a new and this is this is sort of what we do. We hit upon a new idea, we execute it. Now the idea is in the world, i.e., fire. Um, we use it to roast our food. We don't pay attention to it or we treat it cavalierly without humility. Uh, we kick over a limb, the limb catches fire. Half our cave burns down and we go, not going to do that again. And then we proceed to engage in a philosophical, sociological, and in some cases, material and physiological land war against that new innovation. We have done this time out of mind ever since, again, fire all the way to, let's talk about the, the atomic bomb. I was a big fan of the Christopher Nolan movie Oppenheimer. I mean... He was right. You know, uh, you know, uh, uh, Robert Oppenheimer, played by the great Cillian Murphy, is dramatized in that movie, saying to people who are protesting the bomb, uh, scientists who are working with him on the project, who are saying, well, now we defeated Germany. What do we need to use this for? And he literally says, we will not, they, meaning the average person who doesn't understand what's happening at Alamos, they won't understand what we have until they use it. And they won't fear it until they use it. It's a circular logic kind of thing with human beings. So again, I don't, I, I think we have to, we have to define terms here. So first thing, artificial intelligence, AI, implies that there will be fake knowledge somewhere, encased in, in a box somewhere, potentially a black box. Um, at Mountain View and Google's headquarters somewhere. Uh, and I hear to tell they do have something in that black box there that they don't want to let out on the internet. Okay, uh, maybe they do. And, and this is where Elon and all those other guys, Elon, Bezos, kind of lose their mind and their hair falls out. Well, Bezos, his hair has already fallen out. But um, he's part of the fraternity along with me and Bruce Willis and Michael Jordan. Uh, <laughs> we're all in the same fraternity. Um, we're the bald but, community. Um, <laughs> we're the bald, we're, we're exactly, the bald community. Which no one ever talks about bald heads mattering by the way but we're all part of the same community um and uh and uh and uh you know they go to this they go to the meetings and they see what's in the box and they're scared they're scared because well they're scared for a number of different reasons but the primary one is that fear slash utility cycle that they're trying to get us to not go in uh, with their with their innovation. So so that's the first thing. So we have to define terms, right? So artificial means fake. Intelligence means, well, intelligence means a whole lot of different things, right? So the ability to contextualize information and then apply it in the future creatively is intelligence, but it's also consciousness. 
It's wrapped up with consciousness. And consciousness is not only wrapped up with that, but it's also wrapped up with my conception of myself, both embodied and non-embodied. And then Zeb's conception of himself, embodied and non-embodied. And then how does that relate on a hierarchy to something higher? Or if I don't believe that there's something higher, nothing at all. That's all consciousness along with everything else like love and hate and fear and rage and depression and anxiety, all that goes into consciousness. We don't have one-tenth of one percent of consciousness figured out, not even close. We aren't even sure where it is in the human brain, the biology of the brain, much less the psychology and philosophy of the mind. And yet, something in a box in Mountain View is going to be Skynet and kill us? <laughs> I don't think so. And by the way, I don't want to be, I don't want to be, I don't want to come off as being arrogant or having hubris. This is not an arrogant or hubristic statement. This is a statement of the power of human beings. We have to get our confidence back that we're the greatest power on the planet, and we are. But we also have to temper that with humility, which we used to do when we believed in God culturally and collectively. Uh, now we are in a post, we've been a long time in a post Nietzsche and nihilistic world. Mm -hmm. So that's been real tough for us. Uh, and you study philosophy, so you know what I'm talking about. God here. is dead. Right. <laughs> right. And we don't have enough. And what's the back end of that quote? And we don't have enough water to wash the blood of his death off our hands. That's the back end of that quote. It wasn't a triumphant quote. It was a, it was a, it was a, a quote of horror because mm -hmm. what do we do after this? Right. Now, Nietzsche thought that human beings could make their own values out of themselves. And all of our books and all of our historical experience and all of our lived experience in our own lives and our own families, all the way scaled out to other people's lives and other people's families, tells us that that is incredibly hard. And sometimes it doesn't work to scale it to the larger community because there's just too many people who have too many different conceptions of consciousness, intelligence, and values. Okay. So am I worried about AI? Nope. But I am worried about large language models. And here's why I'm worried about LLMs. What human beings will do, and you can mark my words in this podcast and play it 10 years from now, because I guarantee you this is going to happen. We will anthropomorphize the responses contextually that we get from LLMs and call them human. We will call them intelligence. We will call them consciousness. They won't actually be that thing. They will be no more conscious than my Apple computer that I have in my pocket is that I call a mobile phone. But we, my fear is that if we don't have the appropriate humility and the appropriate broad generalization of knowledge that comes from literature and comes from applying those experiences, we won't know how to remove that anthropomorphization from the machine and put it where it appropriately needs to go. And by the way, we already have people doing this. So people name their phones, if you don't believe me. Oh, you, oh name, yeah. I've, I've also said for, for a long time, or I thought that this would happen, that we won't be able to tell the difference necessarily between who's a conscious entity and what's AI. Oh, we will, like, no, no. We will be able to tell the difference. We won't want to. Mm. We'll like, be able that, to the, tell the difference. What's that Robin Williams movie? <laughs> to use another pop culture reference, there was a movie where he was like a robot, basically. Oh, uh, Bicentennial Man. I think, yeah. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so we... I'm going to go Conti in here for just a second, and then I'm going to bring it down to earth. So again, you've, you've studied philosophy, um, and I've read my fair share of it. Immanuel Kant, the forerunner of Friedrich Nietzsche, um, a German philosopher back in the mid 18th century, um, mid to late 18th century. He had several different ideas, but one of his most important ones that relates to this particular conversation that we're having right now was the idea of a first mover. And basically what he said was, uh, without going into deep in the philosophy of it, and you can go read this yourself, basically said that we can't have a thing that moves without something acting on it. You can't have an unmoved mover, in essence. But his assertion in that was that the thing which moves cannot overcome the thing that moves it. 
in essence, uh, physics can't go backwards. And by the way, quantum physics shows this, uh, right. you know, <laughs> you know, quantum theory uh, proves this. Um, even Einstein's mathematics and Einstein didn't like quantum theory. He thought it was nonsense. And I, I understand why, but even Einstein's mathematics proved began to prove this idea of the, um, of the moved object being unable to basically go backward and unmove itself. Right. Okay. How does this relate to AI? Right. Or we're euphemistically calling AI or even this idea of consciousness. Well, who moves the algorithm? We do <laughs> every single time and twice on Sundays. <laughs> Search just doesn't jump out of my computer and come rob me in my office or come rob me in my kitchen. Um, Chat GPT for all of its wonder at ginning up images and ginning up um, prompt based um, answers to questions and queries doesn't leap out of the machine and force itself on me. That's right. Just to cut in as a, as a social media marketer and search marketer, like at ZV Media, we are literally our ads are tailored around either keywords or interests, what people are generally posting or clicking on. It's just our ads are, are, are targeted to respond to people based on what they are watching or looking at or by their behaviors. Bingo. And so who has the behavior? And who has the, and where is the response? Well, the behavior is in me taking action to click. And then the response comes after the click. But if I take no action, even doom scrolling, which apparently is a thing now, <laughs> even when I'm doom scrolling, I'm taking action. I am a mover. If I do nothing with that mobile phone, if I do nothing with that social media platform, guess what it does? Nothing. Hmm. Unless it's listening to you while you're near the device. <laughs> well, even with it listening to me, it can't do anything. Right. It can push. It, so here's what, with, look at, again, look, listen to the words we use, right? It can push and add to me, but that pushing action isn't an action generated by an independent entity getting out of the car and pushing the car. It's generated by a series of mathematical equations <laughs> that are designed to basically be ones and zeros. Yep. It's not human, folks. It, it doesn't have a humans. mind. It was, it it's was, right. It's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it doesn't have a mind. There's no mind in the box. Well, I shouldn't say there's no mind. There's a mind in the box. There is a mind in the box. It's the mind of the first developer. Right. That Well, that, and that's what AI is, right? Like, as I understand it, you know, you had an initial developer, obviously, but then it's able, rather than having to update the software, it's able to... But it can't go backward. But right. it can't go backward. It can't go backward and overcome its creator. Right. And it never will. Right. What does that make us? Does that make us gods? Well, maybe to the algorithm, it makes us God. Maybe the algorithm winds up worshiping us. But that would imply that the algorithm has the ability to hierarchically conceptualize itself. And I have yet to see any machine or any collection of data that can hierarchically conceptualize self without independent of a first mover. Right. We're the only beings on the planet. Even our animals can't do that. We are the only beings on the planet that can do that. That We may share 99.5% of genes with the monkeys, but that 0.5% that separates us from the chimps, that stops us from throwing our poop and gets us to the moon, that's really important stuff, folks. Yeah. So I'm a fan of man. I I'm, I'm probably the last genuine humanist um, I'm the last genuine creative humanist because I believe that human beings were designed by a creator to be a mover in the world and nothing will overcome that. That's a statement about reality. But we but, can easily give up our autonomy. We can give up our stuff. And when, that is what I fear we, we will do. I fear we will become so lazy 
that we will give that up. And so the podcasts, the books, the efforts that I do, because leadership fundamentally begins with self. How are you leading yourself? All of these things are about keeping humanity, keeping individual human beings aware of their own autonomy and their abilities and their own, the, 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 the glory of their own power that they have, that they can execute and keeping that intentionally at the front of their minds. Fantastic. I, I think what you, you nailed it there. I think it's a very, to be humanist is a, is a bold position and will be increasingly important. Um, as one coach that I've worked with says, take your power back. And that, that's mm-hmm. what we have to be able to do. And I think we need sometimes things that people wrongly think are irrelevant or old. I think we need to reach into our, our toolbox uh, from the great thinkers, from the great books, um, from people past and present uh, with wisdom to share, take the good, you know, you don't have to cancel out something just because certain things were bad. There's always good that we can take from certain things that are relevant and will help us navigate in these new times going forward with AI. And um, we have to have the the tools and the confidence to not give up our choice and our humanity. Um, so Awesome. Well, we also have to take our power back. This is the last thing I'll say. You sure. should take your power back, right? Um, we need to remember that we have the autonomy and we have the ability to peel back the layers of the machine. So right now what we are doing is we are building a, and, and again, this is a Western thing. This is the, this is the top we talk a lot about the 1% in our culture now, um, the the 1% of people in the global population, right? Because the other 99% of folks in the global population are worried about other things. <laughs> but the top 1%, here's what we're doing. We are building a Tower of Babel. And if you go back and read um, in the book of Genesis, in that hoary old book that also defies the algorithm, it's called the Bible. I actually just reread that story a couple weeks ago. <laughs> there you go. So the Tower of Babel is very relevant to our time. And so here's, for those of you who won't go back and read that hoary old book, um, the, 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 the Tower of Babel comes about after, um, the, um, after the, the, the worldwide flood, right, of Noah. And um, the human beings all get together, the descendants of Noah, and they, they say, we will build a tower um, that will honor us. And so they go and they begin to build a tower and, and occasionally, and, and by the way, they all speak one language, right? Um, and and that, that's very important. It's not a side note. That's, that's very important. It's critical to the conception of themselves, right? So they all speak one language. They're all united. Dare I say they have one world order. <laughs> and uh, they decide they're going to build a tower to, to honor, not God, but to honor themselves. Because just after you've had a worldwide flood and God's wiped you all out, and you can call that nature if you would like, the first thing you're going to do is honor yourself. That's actually very human. Turns out they were human beings just like us. So of course they take their technology, which at the time was bricks and mud, and they begin to build a tower to the heavens. And instead of God, that spirit of the age coming down the tower and telling them to stop, instead it sends out some angels, some messengers, and they go and they say, well, what is this thing that is being built? And they investigate and they return to the Godhead. They return to the top of the hierarchy and the top of the hierarchy says, wait a minute. He doesn't say it to the people, by the way, he goes, wait a minute. Once these people, these humans build a tower to me and they will touch the heavens, there is nothing that will be outside of their ability to do. Once they transcend a certain level in the hierarchy, they will become like me. I can't have that. And so the spirit of the age scrambles their speech, breaks up the one world order, and scatters them to the four winds. Okay. What can we take from this old mythological sounding story that has vaguely spiritual elements to our postmodern ears? From the best-selling book. (laughs) From the best-selling book, right? (laughs) The book that will still be in print all the way to the end of the age. Uh, (laughs) Um along with Shakespeare and probably Dante too. Like those are going to be the big three at the end. Um, What can we take from the Tower of Babel? Well, there's a truth about human beings that is in that. And the truth about human beings that is buried in that is if we have the technology like the fire or the atomic bomb or the AI, we are going to 
use that tower to honor. We're going to use that technology to honor ourselves, to honor our base desires and our base needs. And if that steps over other people, if it uh, um, if it violates the hierarchical reality of the universe, we're okay with that. And that can always, can always, and will always lead to destruction. And so the way out of that is to listen to the voices of the messengers, to listen to the voices of the people who are saying, stop, don't do that. Let us not build a tower to ourselves. Let us instead use our technology, use our bricks and mortar to do something better. Your key question there, and I'm wrapping up here, I'm running, turning the corner. Your key question there was, do we need to be better human beings? And the answer to wrap up is yes, we do. And the great books can show us a way towards being better human beings, but only if we actually crack them open, turn off the internet, turn off the Netflix, and actually spend time engaged with them. Beautiful. That's a great way to end it. And you have the power to turn it off, people. That is your choice, what you do with, with your time. If you want to consume more uh, anxiety-ridden things or or whatever, or or buy things, or if you want to enrich your mind and um, you know take control of your destiny. Where can people find you? What is... Obviously, I'll put in the show notes a link to your your management consulting company, Leadership Toolbox, and your podcast uh, about the great books. What, where are some, where should people find you, or is there anything uh, you'd like people to look up? Absolutely. So, first off, I'd like to thank um, I would like to thank you, Zev, for inviting me on your podcast today and giving me the opportunity on your platform that you're building um, to talk with your to talk with your audience. I, I appreciate the opportunity to do that every single time that it's offered to me and please continue doing the continue doing the work that you're doing um, and continue moving forward in um, in this space we need more voices like yours as far as where people can find me look you can always find me on linkedin so uh just type in my first name hayson j-e-s-a-n last name sorrells s-o-r-r-e-l-l-s you can find me on linkedin i'm also on instagram occasionally lurking around there in the background um but you could also connect with my company, Leadership Toolbox, um, on Instagram. You could follow us there. Uh, we've started posting reels because we've decided that, okay, now's the time to start posting reels. So we post reels, which are one to two minute clips of various elements of podcasts. And we're going to be doing that for the remainder of this year. So you can pick that up and start, start sampling the podcast, the video version of it in a really interesting way. You could also find um, our podcast, Leadership Lessons from the Great Books, on YouTube, uh, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, and of course, on Apple and all of the other devices where you listen to podcasts on. Leave a five-star review if you love it. If you don't love it and it's not your cup of tea, please don't say anything at all. Just <laughs> go find someplace else on the internet to hang out. Um, by the way, if you want to get books because you don't want to listen to the podcast or you do like the idea of buying a book from me, you could buy my most recent book, 12 Rules for Leaders, The Foundation of Intentional Leadership with my co-author, Bradley Madigan. And you can get that on Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble and anywhere where you buy books. And of course, that's in Kindle format, hardcover and softcover. Makes a great Christmas gift for the leader or holiday gift for the leader in your life. And finally, uh, if you want to take advantage of our training and development services, you can go check go check out all of those at leadershiptoolbox.us. Uh, please go ahead and take a look um, if you are running an organization, running a business, uh, civic, uh, public, private, nonprofit. We work with everybody um, from, from teams as small as five to 10, all the way up to teams of 5,000. And we can scale to your business. Uh, with our Leadership Toolbox Masterclass and deliver these insights to your folks directly. So check us out at leadershiptoolbox.us. Thank you so much. I'll link that all up in the show notes. Hey, San, it was a pleasure. Thank you for coming on and I'm sure we'll do this again soon. Absolutely. Thank you, Zev. Have a great day.